Well, hello and welcome to our very first Ask a Woman interview. It's going to be a series of digital interviews with key women, with key messages for other young women in particular. And for the very first interview, I'm delighted to welcome a remarkable woman both on and off the professional stage. She's an international trade lawyer, former EU trade negotiator, as well as the founder of an extraordinary charity called Inspiring Girls, which links up professional women to mentoring schoolgirls around the world. She is Miriam Gonzalez Durantis and it is really great to welcome you to this our first Ask a Woman interview. How are you doing? Thanks so much. Very well. You're too kind. Well, wow, it's great to see you and it is really great to just introduce you as Miriam Gonzalez Durantis. And uh, you would have thought that that was the normal thing. <laughs> <laughs> no. Because <laughs> I listened to an interview the other night that you did with Radio 4 and they inter introduced you just on, along those lines, uh, you know, just with your yeah. professional, yeah, yeah. your name. And they didn't mention <laughs> who yeah, you're married to. <laughs> How did, did that feel like a moment of liberation? I have got very used now to be called lots of different things. So, um, you know, from Miss Gonzalez, Miss Durantes, um, Mrs. Clegg, Lady Clegg. Um, <laughs> Lady Clegg. So I see the whole, the whole game. And generally, I think that it is very clear when somebody refers to you uh, through the name of your husband, if you haven't decided freely and voluntarily to, to take it. Because in my case, that is how you are known publicly, you know, in, in certain atmospheres. And that is simply a way to, to recognize you or so. And when somebody's doing that to you, just to tell you that you are not worth it if it wasn't because you are married to a particular man. And that bit is what, uh, what worries me. It worries, it, it concerns me, it, it upsets me. Um, not only on my behalf, but on, on behalf of women altogether. No? And I suppose it's just one of those unfortunate realities that, you know, endlessly people say, well, you are the wife of the former Deputy Prime Minister, Nick Clegg. It's sort of, in a way... It is that's a, a fact. Of, that's a fact. <laughs> this is it. It's a fact and it's a shorthand and it allows yeah. people to just get yeah, in yeah. very quickly to say, ah, oh, of course, that's, that's yeah. who we're hearing And from. that's absolutely fine. No? So it's, it's the intention behind it sometimes that you can <laughs> absolutely see it coming. And it links to that tradition that um, at some point women have been seen sometimes as only worth it because of who their father is, who their husband is, who they are sleeping with, you know. And it's, look, it's over now, eh? It's, it's so 21st it's, century, yes, let's put it yeah. behind. And it's so over for you. You're now, you know, um, you know invited on to talk it should be over for everybody. It should be over for everybody. But that moment the other evening when I heard you introduce and you were there to talk about Brexit and you were there because of your in-depth expertise on, you know, trade negotiations. I mean, that must have felt like a sort of liberating moment, I suppose. No, it felt like the normal thing. It happens mm, yeah. also. It happens also very often. But I, you know, if you really want to know my own view on this name issue, I don't think that it's only when you are an expert and you're speaking as an expert on your own area of expertise that you should be called however you wish. Yeah. Yeah. You should be called however you wish in any circumstances, who is anybody else yeah. to tell you anything, right? So, you know, if, if women decide to take the name of their husbands, great. If they don't decide to do it, great. But who is anybody else to tell us how we should be called? Absolutely. So we're at a very critical point in the Brexit process. I mean, we've had so many weeks that we've been told this is the crunch week, this is the crunch week. We really are in a really crucial period at the moment. Give us your take on it and where we're at. I think that with the European Union, we are very close to an agreement. I think that the proposal that the Prime Minister has uh, from the European side on Northern Ireland is a good proposal. The EU has gone a long way to accommodate to concerns that she um, has, understandably. Um, I think that in terms of the political declaration for the next agreement, which is the other thing that is debated a lot in the UK, but not so much in Europe, mm -hmm. <laughs> because in Europe it is continental Europe, so to speak, um, with Ireland. Um, this is um, something that clearly is being seen as a post-March 2019 issue. But you know, the proposal that uh, 
Theresa May has made through checkers, if you unscramble it <laughs> and you put it, all those elements, you put them back in the model of a Canada-like agreement, that is a possible way forward. So I think that with the European Union, we are very close. What nobody knows, and I certainly don't know, is what happens then, not only within Parliament, but within the Cabinet itself. And, and the political shenanigans that we have seen for the last two years, it's very difficult to make any sense of, of them, and I certainly cannot predict. So, so there's been enough movement, you think, potentially for, the, for there to be an A deal from the EU's perspective to get things through. What do you think her chances are of really getting this through, A, through Cabinet, and B, ultimately through Parliament? Well, I honestly don't know, because um, I think it could be a mistake to look at Parliament in particular and to look at it from the prism of who is in favour of uh, a deal, who is not in favour of a deal, and they just want to go through the WTO model or so. I think what is happening in the main two parties, in the Conservative Party and the Labour Party, is that Brexit is becoming a proxy for an internal civil war within those parties. And then there will be factions of each of those two parties that would vote in a particular way, mm. not necessarily because of what they think should be done, but because the others <laughs> in their party are voting exactly the opposite. So it really is very difficult to make uh, predictions. And I think that um, what I take from it is that Brexit is not the end of the issues that are taking place in this country. Brexit is only one step, and we will discover in April 2019 that the deep divisions continue and they need to be sorted out with much more time and much more dialogue. Yeah, well, we'll talk, talk about that in a minute because it would be really interesting to see what you've made of this country that you've adopted so closely as your home and, and the shift that has happened within it in the time that you've, you've lived here. Um, but just to talk a bit about the Prime Minister herself, because you've interviewed her too, because yes. you did her <laughs> when you were guest editing the Today yeah. programme. How do you uh, see her faring at the moment? I mean, some people have given her a bit of sympathy, I think, because they realise what an almost intractable issue she's got to solve. And then she's sort of doggedly, whatever you make of the politics, she's doggedly at it, you know. I think that is unavoidable that when you see somebody uh, suffering within her own party and, and the cabinet itself, um, that sort of elicits the sympathy that pity normally um, takes with it. Uh, what I make of what she has done is that she has made two very fundamental mistakes, one probably much more important than the other. Uh, in political terms, given the Article 50 notice, without knowing even within the cabinet, and probably even herself, <laughs> what she wanted to do in terms of the relationship with the European Union, that was a by the book mistake. I mean, that really is unforgivable, and it has weakened this country to a point that it wasn't necessary at all. We could have done this negotiation from a more of a position of, of strength, and that is her own doing, and that is her responsibility, and at some point she will have to pay the bill so for she, doing that. So she's brought it on herself, effectively, that's what you Not said. on herself, on the country. On the country. You know, which is what really worries me as the mother of three British children. But for me, what is much more important is that she stood there when she was uh, you know, appointed, when she had all the political credibility, all these first days, whenever somebody comes to power, that is when you can do most things. You know? and, and instead of trying to bring the country together, she stood there by the door of number 10 and she basically said to half of this country that not only they even have the, the right to think differently, but they could not even say it. You know? Is that kind of silencing this, this, the citizens of, of the world who are the citizens of nowhere? I mean, that honestly, you know, I have been <laughs> waiting for you sound a quite woman. Angry about it, Marie. No, I, I'm not angry. I'm, you know, I, I'm disappointed, no, because I have waited my whole life, 50 years that I have now, <laughs> <laughs> to see women in power so that they would do politics differently and it would not be so tribal and they would bring people together. You know, all these things that we always say that. You know, women have this um, emotional intelligence and we negotiate more and we just, we are attuned to what everybody, well, there was an example as to how this really doesn't depend on gender. So you don't think she's got emotional intelligence then? 
Well, she may have it, but at that moment, really, I think that that was a terrible thing to do to the country. And again, we continue paying the consequences because two years on, this country continues deeply divided. Do you think we might be headed for a second referendum? We know, obviously, that um, your other half <laughs> would uh, it, has been at the forefront, even before other people caught up with it. He was pushing for it very hard. Do you think we might be headed that way? I don't know. And I really, you know, because I didn't vote, uh, I couldn't vote yeah. on the first referendum. For me, all the discussions about the referendum is interesting to, to note it, you know. Um, but I don't know whether there would be a referendum, whether there would be an election, whether simply a deal would go through. Really, everything everything is possible. And, and from where I sit, which is advising companies uh, in terms of these negotiations and what it means for them, both uh, politically and, and um, economically and, and legally, um, you know, there is a lot of concern because since all these scenarios are now possible, not because of the negotiations with the EU, but because of parliaments, they need to prepare for you know, <laughs> five or six different scenarios that could not be farther away from each other. That's a lot of time and a lot of money for everybody. The principle... And around. the cost of opportunity. Yeah. That while we do that, we are not doing something else. What about the argument, though? And, it, it, you know, it's been, it's been well chewed over, this argument that to go back to ask the British public a second time is, is a basic affront to democracy. I really, this really is for you guys. That, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you decided to have the first referendum um, because that was in the manifesto of David Cameron. He obviously got an absolute majority, so that is the reason why um, there was... A referendum, whether... Do you think it'd be the, fair to go back and ask again, though? I honestly don't have a view. I mean, for me, whether it's a referendum, <laughs> whether nothing it's an else election, or whether the deal goes through, you know, that is for the British people to, to decide. And I think that most Europeans are firmly of that view, that this is a process that you need to sort out within the country, and nobody's you, going to sort it out. Yeah, but you've got, you you still, you've got a stake in it, and not obviously just because... Um, oh, I would uh, have preferred that, that the UK did not leave the, clear, clear. the European Union, of course. And in my, you know, clearly your view. We are an international family, and for us this is not about um, customs or phytosanitary controls. <sighs> this, is, this is how we live. And um, for me, the freedom of movement in particular, that, that changed my life. <laughs> you know, I was able to go to study in Brussels, I met Nick there, we were working in Brussels, then we came here. I didn't even have to think about visas or permits or registrations. I mean, it's, it's a freedom that, that I have internalized. Mm. <laughs> and now suddenly I have to think, wow, even if I have British children, you know, I, I just don't know how some circumstances are going to play. No? But, but because you have British children, presumably you must have a view on whether a second referendum would be a good idea or not? I, I honestly don't care so much whether there is a referendum or not. What I think that I actually don't think that even a second or a third or whatever referendum or I don't know how many elections that you could have is going to sort it in the short term. This country is very divided. Sometimes it looks almost like a, an intellectual civil war. Um, and it's going to take a long time and putting the issues on the table, not just fighting it tribally. Uh, between the two main parties to, to sort it out. And you know, you're going to have to, to involve the next generation there. You know, it's, this is not a matter of sorting it out with technicalities and paragraph three mm. in an agreement. This is, this is a proper big political and generational debate. You know? It is very difficult to see how the country can be run without taking into account what the young people want. <laughs> that is their future. I suppose it's the disconnection between the sort of life that you've been fortunate to lead um, and parts of the United Kingdom who've felt disconnected for that, from that, whether it's through poverty or lack of aspiration or lack of opportunity. A lot of people have pointed to that and said, you know, after the hard years of austerity, a lot of that dissatisfaction grew out of that situation, that you had a class of people, a political class in particular, that was so far removed now from the realities of a lot of British life. That well, Brexit I, was that I, I live in, in London. I have seen the two parts of the UK that I know best are London and, and Sheffield. No? And in both places, very, very different. You can see, and particularly here in, in London, that people of, of every um, social background have benefited enormously from the diversity and the possibility to, 
to move freely and sometimes it's not the fact that you go somewhere else but it's <laughs> that you are in contact with with other people as well and of course I'm absolutely aware of the fact that the the 2008 financial crisis had an effect that that we are only realizing now how big uh, that was and probably probably Brexit would not have happened without the 2008 crisis I'm, I'm not sure about the link with austerity no because I I look at the US um, where you didn't have the austerity policy and, and very similar developments have happened there in terms of po some people saying, well, we reject um, a certain lifestyle, as you put it. <laughs> and, and that has had a lot of unpredictable consequences in, in politics. You know? So I, I wonder whether, you know, I think that that is the obvious <laughs> way to look at it, but I wonder whether it is true. Where do you think we'll be in April next year? Where, do, where, if you had to try to discern where... My own view is that we would be in a transition process towards, um, um, towards the entry into force of Brexit. What I have no idea is where this country would be politically. It's interesting that you raise the issue of the United States, because I'd, I'd love to hear what you make of the fact that against a backdrop of apparently women finding their voices in places that they haven't before, whether it's in reaction to, to what happened with the Me Too movement, um, whether it's gender pay and the noise that's blown up around that, that some of the key political figures we've seen emerge on the world stage are these so-called strong men, so Trump, Putin well established, of course, Erdogan. How does that sit against the backdrop of women hoping that things might be turning for the better at some point. Well, I think that that is about the the only thing that that women like me, I would like to think like us, mm. <laughs> have to to say thank you to President Trump for because I'm I'm convinced that Me Too would not have happened if it wasn't part of a reaction to the election of a president who spoke about women in the terms that that he spoke, whether he thinks that or not, but he said it and, uh, you know, it was clearly said <laughs> and, and there wasn't the kind of apology and, and self-flagellation mm -hmm. that you need to have when, when you have done something like that. You know? so, so I think it was that reaction and the reaction to what he started doing in terms of reproductive rights, what, what led to, to a lot of feelings that were brewing for a long time to suddenly come out. And it was the interaction, in my view, of the reaction to President Trump and social media that made it possible for women who normally we behave as a minority pretty much everywhere. Every country that I have looked into, we tend to be the majority. We behave like a minority. <laughs> so, mm. so we complain, we go to demonstrations. So da, why da, da. These and they suddenly came together and, and the explosion of the Me Too happened. No? And it's, it's a thoroughly, you know, obviously whenever you have something like this, it goes a little bit in all directions and at some point it, it finds its natural uh, rhythm. But it's a thoroughly positive thing that, that many women who didn't dare to speak up are finally speaking up. But I suppose we're in an era where we have these, a certain type of man in key world leadership positions. And it's not perhaps where a lot of women, particularly women who call themselves feminists, would have thought we might be at this stage in our lives. Why do you think these men have emerged as such I, powerful political characters? I don't see it so much as um, strong men versus women. I think that it is the search for strength and simple, simple uh, messages. Now, that is why we get the, the populism reaction. And obviously, in that strong political figure, we happen to have many more men. <laughs> than we have women. No? So, so for me, it's, much more, it's determined much more by the image of strength than by the gender. Talk to me about your feminism, because you've attributed it to your grandfather. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a, there's a key yeah. masculine figure in your life. Yeah. And, and he you was, trace it back yeah, to him. He, is, um, he came from a very um, unprivileged uh, background in a tiny, tiny village. I mean, it's... It's really difficult to find it there in the, in the map in Spain. I think it's only the reporters of the Daily Mail who managed to find it during the elections. And, um, and he, had, um, he had three children and, and then 
many years later, kind of eight years la later, he had my mother. And by that time, he had managed the poor thing to, to gather a little bit of money um, to be able to send her to, to study. And, um, and he insisted on what he called a, was a proper degree that for him was chemistry and physics. And, uh, and therefore, for my mother, it was a very big thing to be able to work and to use that degree. And it, it felt like a duty. And for me, it still does. I still feel that things that I do in my life, um, you know, I look backwards. This is, I, I owe it to, to my grandparents. You know, they, they made such an effort to ensure that my parents could have the life they had. And my parents, in turn, they did that for, for us. So, so whenever you were talking earlier about privileges and so, I think that, you know, you need to look at things throughout the generations, and you know, whenever somebody has made an effort for you, well, you kind of let them down. And how did it sort of shape your early working life then? Because you had a lot of rejections, didn't you? you worked incredibly hard as a result of this opportunity that had been given to you, but you had to sort of then really get into the fight, and I suppose that's where people test their, test mm -hmm. their wits first off as a woman. I didn't really feel any discrimination while I was a standing, or I didn't feel at the time <laughs> that I was facing any discrimination. And probably something that has happened to, uh, to lots of women with the Me Too campaign is that we have gone backwards to examine yes, little attitudes <laughs> that, they were, yeah. that we didn't really notice because we have internalized sexism as a you know, background <laughs> noise. And, and I was like, wow, yeah, that wasn't the right thing. But I didn't really truly feel it at all while I was studying. But obviously, when I started having children, it became uh, more of an issue, and I was doing a foreign affairs uh, job, incredibly busy uh, at the time when I started having um, my eldest and then my, my second son, um, working on relations with Northern African countries and the Middle East. And, um, and yeah, it's, it was a big thing sometimes to go pregnant to some of the meetings, really. So talk to me a bit, Miriam, about inspiring girls. First of all, how on earth you managed to find the time to do this alongside your job was extraordinary. But this is the charity that you set up a few years ago with the express intention of getting professional women hooked up to talk to schoolgirls to inspire them and mentor them into professional work. Tell me a bit about it. It's, it's not um, just professional women, it's all sorts of women. So it's women from all walks of life, um, senior, junior, um, all young, working full time, part time, uh, women who stop working and have gone back, stay at home moms, it's absolutely everybody. And all that we do is that we ask for one hour per year to go back to school to tell the girls what have you done in your life and, uh, and to show them all the enormous amount of things and, and different models in life that, that women now follow. And you know, they should feel completely free to choose. They should look first, <laughs> look wide, look without thinking about gender stereotypes, and then decide whatever you want to do. And whenever you have decided, we give them a little message of, then try to be good <laughs> and better make an effort. No? But it really is about the, the freedom and, and and putting the labels, the labels away, and we have had extraordinary um, progress. Really, we are in eight countries now. We were told earlier this week that it will go to Asia in a couple of months' time. That I'm delighted. We are um, launching in the next few months an online tool so that girls from from their home, from their sofa, can get in touch with the role models, provided they have internet, which is something that really obsesses me. That we should. We should make this available to everybody. You know, I have spent three years and a half running this campaign, and, and a lot of that time has been on trying to find the female role models. Mm -hmm. And I realized last year that the issue is not finding the female role models. Female role models are an abundant resource. The only issue is to connect them yeah. with the girls. So if we can use modern technology to connect them, you know, Let's do tick. That yeah. problem is sorted, the yeah. access to female role mothers. Let's move to the next thing. No? But you're a mother of sons, I'm the same. Yeah. Um, why girls? I mean, there are quite a lot of challenges for young men, particularly at the moment, I think, to try and navigate the way that they need to be and operate in the workplace and operate within relationships. Why was it? Well, that's what I do at home. You do at home. <laughs> 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 but why did you opt for that in particular? What, what, and I have what always gaps been did you see? Preoccupied. I saw it myself when Nick was in government that I was um, 
subject to a series of labels. You know, very early on, um, I had the professional woman label, and little did I know that that label comes with another range of labels <laughs> <laughs> attached to it, and the the nationalistic right media here at some point started, you know, all sorts of things from um, she's not used to being at the school gates, she may be scary to children, putting into question whether I was a good wife or a good mother or whatever. And um, so I was aware of the fact that, that these things um, uh, happened to, to women because I had seen it myself. And then I saw some really interesting research, the girl guides to fantastic research year after year. Um, about how girls themselves feel that they don't have access to female role models. So I thought it's, this is ridiculous because this problem we can sort it. <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> there are so many. So let's just bring them to the girls. And initially we thought let's bring them to the schools. And now it's like let's make it bigger. We just bring them to their computers. So, you know, they, they no should not really have any issues with this. <laughs> it should be an easy, you know, there are many other aspects of the gender uh, debate that are much more difficult to sort out because some of them imply really difficult decisions, you know, like who is going to be responsible for the society of care. It is a tricky decision because, because obviously we do that from economies <laughs> that have been struggling at some point. But this thing of female role models, honestly, if we can sort this out, we can sort out anything. <laughs> and you had a platform. I mean, you have to credit, yes, your, you know, course. you're in a position oh, where absolutely. at that point yeah. being being Mrs. Clegg was quite handy. <laughs> Mrs. Clegg, yes. <laughs> Mrs. Clegg was quite, well, I'm not saying Lady Clegg. Yeah, of least. course, I was able to do it with <laughs> the strength able, that I would not have been able to, to do it uh, otherwise. And that was fantastic. It really compensated for all the comments from the all the Mail. comments from the Daily Mail. <laughs> did they get under your skin? Did they really get under your skin? Was it not something that started to sort of get sort of... No, not under my skin. What, um, what I think is difficult to, to do is to, to have some of that and not to be able to answer back. Mm. I'm in much, you know, much better position being able to answer back and I, I like the debate. So, for example, with the Daily Mail, um, when I interviewed the Prime Minister at that radio <laughs> occasion, I invited the editor of the Daily Mail at the time, and he refused to come to the debate with you. me. <laughs> you were all ready for I'm it. I'm still waiting. You're still waiting. You're still, <laughs> yeah, we can bring him in here if you like. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> but you talked about, I was just looking, you did a, a statement on the website um, for the International Day of the Girl. Yes. And you were talking on that about the one, the key thing that really strikes you about these young girls is this issue of a lack of self-confidence. Yeah. And where do, what, what is that all about? It's, it's shocking, really. It's, for me, it's the biggest surprise in this campaign. No matter whether you are in um, Santiago de Chile, whether you're in rural Serbia, whether you are just beside the city of London, you go to talk to 13, 14 years old girls, and the issue that keep com is com keeps coming up is uh, lack of self-confidence. And they ask you directly, they, where did you get <laughs> the self-confidence? Which I think is, is so sweet, but it sort of assumes that you have it, <laughs> that you're not struggling uh, then. But I think that it comes a little bit from what we were discussing earlier, from the gender stereotypes that, that are there. And they start noticing from whenever they are six, five or six years old, they start looking at, at jobs in particular as jobs for men and jobs for women. And here in the, in the UK, Inspiring Women, which is how I started the, the campaign and, and it's done with the Education and Employers Task Force, they have done um, a parallel campaign in primary schools. And it's, you know, the results are amazing. They bring panels of men and women and they ask them, what job um, do you think that these people have? <laughs> you would be completely shocked. Yeah? So men sometimes they say boss without even knowing what kind of boss it is. No? If the woman happens to be young and pretty is a model, party organizer. I don't know why we are party <laughs> organizers. <laughs> they been to one it of starts hands. very early on. At that age, they can hardly explain properly the biological difference between men and women, and they already start looking at them with a different filter, and then it keeps building. So by that uh, age of 13, 14, it is when some girls start thinking some subjects may not be for me, this sport is, may not be for girls. And if you don't you know, get rid of it there, like if it's a bad wit, 
it keeps growing. And it's what explains that afterwards, some women don't dare to negotiate their salaries properly. So some women who have been appointed to something start doubting, perhaps I have only been put in this situation because been given this job because I'm a woman. Like if anybody would pay you for being a woman only. You know, all those kind of things that happen later on, I think that we could sort them much earlier, no? with a tiny bit of attention. Again, this is not, you know, complex. It's just all of us thinking a bit you know, how do we come across to them? We don't notice it, but they do. They do notice it. So when they ask you about the self-confidence thing, and we're all intrigued by it, where, what do you say to them? Where, when, you feel as if you're, when you feel as if you're wobbling, I mean, it's a hard thing to imagine. In the experience. I find it but, in the experience well, yeah. and in the people around me. Um, and um, you know, confidence is a product of your experience. Whenever you have done something, 25 times, the 26th time, you know that you can do it. <laughs> and you also know, which I think that is even more important, that if you mess up, it's not the end of the world. That, because that's there would a be real another thing, point. isn't it? Of course. And particularly, it's that fear of failure that's at the heart of something. Exactly. Much, you don't learn without, without failure. No? But the very first time, um, I learn it by looking at the people around me. And, you know, if, if people around me think that I can do something, well, perhaps I can. <laughs> I haven't realised that. You try it on, and that's life. No? You have talked and written about your love of food and your your yes. blog, Mum and Sons, <laughs> which I mean, it's another of those things. I look at, I think, how does she? How does she have time? I'm Spanish. We cook every day, so and we do it day. simply. We don't do big things. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I, I cook some days, but it doesn't involve the sort of things that you come up with. It's and extraordinary. It's, simple. it's all simple recipes. No, no, no. no. <laughs> so twenty food, minutes done. The food is the big, lovely, homely thing that is at the centre of your family life, I suppose. Yeah, and it's not so much the food. It's what happens around the food, you know. And um, I come from a very strong Spanish tradition and, and my grandmother, the wife of that grandfather who made me a feminist, was, you know, they were in the farm and they were cooking all the time. And, and she had this thing that whenever you would come to visit her, you would know how much she loved you because <laughs> she would have cooked what you really liked. You know? And there was that, oh yeah, wonderful. No? And, and we have taken it afterwards through the generations. So my my mum, you know, when we come home, she cooks <laughs> and and I cook. And it's, it's very much in the Spanish genes. We like somebody and we want to feed them. Yeah. <laughs> so I've just got two things I want to ask you. Just one last thing about about Brexit and then a little about the women who've inspired you. Yeah. Um, when you moved here, you've spoken very passionately about your love of living in this country, yeah. that it offered you freedoms that you never imagined um, that were available to somebody when you were coming from Spain. Um, has the Brexit result and the process changed your view of that country? Not necessarily in terms of freedom, but has it changed your view of the country that you've called home? Probably not completely, but I am aware of it. And it is very difficult to explain sometimes how it feels if you are a European who has lived for a long time here, how it feels to wake up to that referendum result. Because on the one hand, nothing changed. And on the other hand, everything changed. And it was very difficult not to feel that for some people this wasn't just, we don't want to be with you, <laughs> but that it was more the, we are not like you, or probably even that we are better than you. And, and the, all those emotions, you know, it takes a while, and I know many Europeans who have had to go through that, that journey to understanding these are political developments in the country and it has nothing to do with, with uh, those, emotional, those emotional issues. For me, and what I really hope, you know, I have lived in London for 13 years now, I think that this city is just something else. There is nothing like this in the world. So, you know, London is not yours. <laughs> we all make London, right? All that diversity, all the people who come from abroad. So whatever you do with Brexit and with the negotiations or whatever, at least preserve what you have in the city because this really is a privilege. To Could you see a life in politics, frontline politics? Professionally. You? 
I don't really know. And I, you know, I would never say no. And I would never so you're not say out. yes. And, and for me, 2016 was a massive change because I realized, you know, if we don't stand up openly, and I have spoken up politically much more since then than beforehand, both here and, and in my country, you know, countries can take him to a completely different place to what, where I think that they have to be. And I, I, I have a shock to see that we have to fight for individual freedoms sometimes, for democracy, you know, things that I accepted, like, of course, nobody's going to put this into question. And there they are being put into question in international politics sometimes. You know? So, so I'm, I'm telling everybody, you should all go <laughs> into <laughs> politics, every young person that I see, you have to fight for, for what you want. And, and of course, if I had to, I would do that. But having said that, you know the kind of life I have. I'm not in my country and God knows where I will be in the future. So do you I think cannot you might, Do you think you might be, but do you think the consequence of what we're seeing and I cannot vote here, so. You can't vote, <laughs> but do you think you might be back in Spain in the near future? Do you think a life in Spain is possible in the next five years? I honestly don't. If I, something I have learned in my life is that every time that I have made a plan, it has never <laughs> happened. So that's the only constant in my life. Okay. <laughs> so one of the things we're going to ask a woman uh, ask each of our women who come into this studio is three women, inspiring women from history, all the current of history. Who would you have to, to supper? To supper. At, the, <laughs> at Miriam's lovely table. Who would be invited? Who would I have? I would have, um, I think I would have to have Beyonce because um, Beyonce. whenever I ask girls anywhere in the world, who is your number one role model? The name Beyonce. that keeps coming up is Beyonce. <laughs> so I would want to um, to have that discussion with her and to tell her. And, uh, and you know, it's a really hardworking woman. So I think it's a very good example uh, for the girls. Um, I think that um, that probably Sonia Gandhi. I have always been intrigued by um, about what it is to jump into politics after everything that happened with her family and. And to know how to withdraw that for those of us who have looked at politics closely, that is the most difficult thing mm. to do for, <laughs> for any politician. And, and then probably somebody like Frida Kahlo, because, yeah. um, because I like people who break the rules yeah. and also for the Mexican food. So it's Mexican <laughs> food and a bit of flamboyance yes. and colour and, that's and, quite fun. A, and fun. That sounds quite a table. <laughs> yes. Miriam Gonzalez. You're back. invited. Oh, well, I'll come. I'd, God, I loved it. It sounds like a great table. Thank you. Well, if it's to come to sample a bit of the, the food from the blog, it would be, would be lovely. Thank Miriam Gonzalez-Durantes, such a great pleasure to have you as our first Thank guest. Thank you very much. Ask a woman. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Much. It has been a pleasure.